Okay, folks, welcome to another Tuesday night lecture. Uh, I'm Dave, 2i0, Sierra, Juliet, Victor, and this is a Tuesday night uh, lecture series started off by the Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club. Uh, we've been going since uh, lockdown one, if you want to call it that, and uh, we're still going uh, now every second and fourth Tuesday. So if you're watching us live, you're more than welcome. If this is your first time, great to join us. Uh, if you're returning, happy days. Uh, you can also check out all our previous lectures on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash M-U-A-R-C media. Uh, this week, we're joined by Gary. Uh, Gary Q, if I've said that correct. Um, Gary did a talk uh, for another club a number of weeks back that we heard a bit about and thought would be really interesting to hear uh, about it, um, about wide area networks and everything else. He says his chosen uh, hobby isn't amateur radio, but will maybe will maybe convince him after <laughs> after this evening to give it a go. But uh, Gary, you're more than welcome. Um, I don't, do you want to give us a wee introduction there? Tell us a wee bit about yourself, and then it'll be completely over to yourself there. Oh, well, thanks very much. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to, to talk to you this evening. Um, I, I come in here and I put my hand straight up in the air saying, I actually feel like a bit of a charlatan talking to a whole lot of radio experts about radio, but uh, my objective or my, my agenda tonight is maybe to, to pique your interest in the whole area of IoT and maybe show you how radio is leveraged as an important component of IoT, which is, is going to be coming, uh, which will become more and more of a part of our lives as we go on even though by definition, and we'll see in a, in a few moments, by definition, it has very little to do with us because it's a machine-to-machine -machine protocol, but it will become more and more important and will serve more and more functions in our daily lives. Uh, and we'll, we'll go into it in a little bit more detail in a couple of minutes. About myself, um, my background, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I reluctantly went to, to college and studied engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, really, what I want to do is to, to leave school at about 14 and and just get on the tools straight away and make stuff and fix stuff. Um, I, I was that kid. My my biggest problem on Christmas morning was was reassembling my brother's Christmas presents, which I'd taken apart to see how they worked in the small hours of the morning. So I am that kind of curious type. My... my uh, Background as as a, a working adult is in industrial automation. So uh, right from the get go, as soon as I came out of college, in fact, before I'd even finished studying engineering, uh, I was employed in industrial automation. So special purpose machine design. So it would have been programmable controllers, PLCs, uh, pneumatics, hydraulics, electronics, electrical systems, control systems. Uh, some robotics and, and such like. So you can imagine I like to make things that do things or make things that move. Um, so it, the things kind of came and went and, and the economy waned and, and whatnot. Uh, and I found myself, I suppose, six or seven years ago, uh, just looking for something else to do. And came across some new developments in IoT a uh, little bit of home automation stuff. I was curious that you could buy uh, small microcontrollers, not a huge amount of money, and you could make them do very clever things. So considering my background is, is industrial controls, uh, I was all of a sudden looking at very, very powerful microcontrollers the size of my thumbnail, costing a couple of quid, doing principally what I was uh, using very, very expensive industrial controllers to do in the past. And the further I looked into these, I discovered um, stuff like uh, uh, Wi-Fi controllers or Wi-Fi connected devices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, my, my foray into, into kind of radio began. So uh, it, it, that, that kind of went, uh, I went down a rabbit hole, uh, for want of better words, into kind of wireless automation of various things and discovered there might be applications, commercial applications, business applications. And and like I, I, I neglected to say, I've been working as a, a self-employed consultant for the last uh, 10, 15 years. So I'm always looking for business opportunities. 
And then I came across LoRaWAN and the Things Network. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized that this has to become, or, or has to at some point become a, a, a very big spoke in the, the wheel of life, whether it's it's actually LoRa, LoRaWAN, or whether it's other protocols. Uh, and we'll look at some of these in a few minutes. Uh, I wasn't sure. But the more I looked into it, uh, the more I found myself drawn towards the, the whole LoRaWAN and We'll explain what that is in a few minutes. So if, if it's okay with you guys, I have a slide deck I'd like to put up, um, which there's, there's only a couple of slides with, with kind of text. Pretty much everything is just to have in the background kind of graphics. But um, the text is a, a sort of a, it's a pathway that I'm going to try and stick to during the talk this evening. It should keep us somewhat on message. And if, if it's okay with you guys, I'll run through from start to finish how, how everything kind of knits together and try and explain how, how everything kind of works as, as a system. And I'd love to answer a few questions. And, and if there are questions at the end of what might suggest that I've done a half decent job of piquing your interest. So Dave, I'll hand back to you for a second, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sounds great, Gary. So uh, whenever you're ready. You uh, you work away. We're we're all ears. Okay, so um, this is just just a little bit of a, a poster or a billboard to have in the background. Just while I introduce the, the talk. So the Internet of Things. We'll look at a definition in, in a couple of moments, and we'll have a look at at kind of why Internet of Things uh, it, it, why it exists, and and then we'll have a look at how it exists, uh, etc. So just looking at, at at the screen there, we're we're going to come back to uh, the does it fairly representative sample of IoT applications on that screen. Um, so we're going to come back to it in a second. I'm going to go straight on to, to just a list of, of um, bits and pieces we're trying to cover during the course of the, this evening. There's only two or three slides with text on it, by the way, and I, I'm going to get rid of these straight away at the very beginning. So we'll have a look at what is IoT. We'll have a look at the actual definition as, as, as it's printed in, in somewhere like Wikipedia. And that'll give us hopefully a little bit of an idea of which direction I'm going to go in the evening. Um, to my mind, I find that there are, I like to look at this like a matrix. So there are kind of vertical um, drivers of the, the whole technology. So there are, there are industries or industry sectors or application types that, that would benefit from a solution um, such as we see in IoT. And then there are, enablers, which I would consider the horizontals. So they would be the technologies, the, the, the microcontrollers, the radio software, stop, uh, and various other protocols. For example, the, the software stack that allows a lot of these protocols to exist. Um, the fact that they are there allows us to, 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 to solve uh, application problems that we wouldn't otherwise be able to even consider. So we'll, we'll look at a few uh, examples uh, as in the course of the, of the talk. Some of them you've seen already. Uh, you may have seen big belly bins. You know, I'm not sure in, in a lot of the towns in the south there, we have bins with solar. Uh, they're clever for a couple of reasons. We'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. Um, we have uh, kind of smart environment uh, stuff that happens as well. So we've kind of smart street lighting. But this really, I think, is the tin end of the wedge for... Um, what I would consider to be a kind of an omni-aware environment, which I would say is a precursor to a lot of the other stuff that we're currently talking about, like self-driving cars. So you don't have to watch the TV or technology stuff on, on the internet for very long before people start talking about self-driving cars and the, the future of transport being so different to what we know it, uh, at the moment. So I think th there's the enablers which will allow these technologies to exist in five, 10 or 20 years will include an awful lot of, of machine to machine and IOT type devices that make the, the entire environment smart and very aware of itself and very aware of what's happening in the environment. Uh, and then we'll have a look at a couple of uh, very handy, or a couple of applications, stuff that's very convenient. Um, I mean, I, I have here, a prop which I actually built. We'll have a look at this later on. That's a that's a, a supposed to be a humane animal trap. It's only humane if, if you empty it while the poor animal is alive in there. But um, 
we, we built a, a smart animal trap that's connected uh, with a range of kind of 10 kilometers uh, on maybe a five year battery life. So it just shows the kind of stuff that's uh, achievable using IoT technologies as they are at the moment and they're improving. And other stuff like two factor authentication, we're used to doing that on our mobile phones now to secure our bank trans transactions and things like that. But where, where we're precluded by distance from having wired connections, uh, we can use the, these long range uh, radio protocols to allow us to do stuff like two, tenter, uh, two factor authentication to, to open a, a lock, for example, on a, a campus, a gate or something like that. So uh, we'll have a chat about some of these applications as we go, uh, go through the, the talk and hopefully it'll just paint a picture of, of why IoT exists. This is the only other wordy slide, and it just, it's hopefully the, the kind of pathway I'm going to stick to for the rest of the talk. So um, we'll have a quick look at, at the, the history of computers, which ironically, to my mind, has gone around in a full circle. Now, I'm not a, an IT person, with the exception of what I do with, with IoT, um, but I believe we've gone around a full circle, and I'll try and explain what I mean by that in a moment. Um, we'll have a look at different radios um, within, you guys are all amateur radios, or sorry, it's your licensed amateurs. Um, everything I'm talking about tonight is in the ISM band. So it's like your Wi-Fi, like your Bluetooth. Um, so it's in the, the unlicensed parts of the spectrum, and um, we had a few questions about this after the, the talk I did with South Dublin Radio. So um, people who aren't familiar with, with using parts of the unlicensed spectrum had a couple of questions. So I suspect you might have a couple of things to ask me at the end. Uh, no problem there. We'll have a look at, at what's clever about some of the IoT radio protocols. Um, so just to, to throw a couple of buzzwords in, the, these protocols can typically operate below the noise floor. Uh, very, very low uh, signal power, so 25 milliwatt EIRP, um, and yet uh, I have connected um, a mountaintop in Dublin to uh, a base, an antenna, a permanently located antenna in the Isle of Man, so I think that was 220 kilometres. I was on a single uh, lithium cell on an Arduino-based microcontroller, so um, you can see that the low power doesn't necessarily mean short range. We can do some crazy stuff with these radios. And we'll have a look at what the, the kind of secret sauce of LoRaWAN is. It's quite clever how it works. Um, I find it uh, engaging, although it is, I have to say, way above my wheelhouse, uh, above my pay grade. I, I don't understand the, the precise way it works, but I, I do have an understanding of, of fundamentally uh, what's going on. We'll have a look into the, the link budget um, and you guys I'm sure uh, consider link budgets in, in some of your, your transmissions for your longer transmissions. Uh, we'll have a quick chat about power and talk about competing standards. But th this is probably the, the, the last of the, the wordy slides. I'm gonna move straight on now and we'll have a look at some of the applications and just talk about them for a second. And just consider why they exist uh, this did several years ago and will they exist as we know them or will they change in time of um, I'm forgetting my notes here. So let's have a quick look at, at the definition of IoT before I move on. As this, this may be fairly important just to give us an understanding. So as defined in wicked computing devices, mechanical and digital machines, uh, objects, animals, people, that are provided with unique identifiers and ability to transfer data over a network with or without requiring a human to human or human to computer interaction. So there's quite a lot of words in there. Essentially that says it's machine to machine communication. So this is where we have uh, smart devices talking to smart devices. They're created by us, they're set up by us, they're, they're there to serve us, but they don't involve us. So, um, I would say it, it, it is completely the opposite of, of how you understand how you use computers at the moment. I'm staring into a laptop and right in front of me is a mobile phone and everything we do with computers, typically um, we're operating, we're, we're kind of using them as an interface uh, to, to connect to the internet and, and do stuff. IoT is all about giving that power to 
uh, devices, making devices smart enough to talk to each other. And, and by having large numbers of devices collecting large large amounts of large volumes of, of tiny fragments of data, we can end up with very powerful solutions. So at the risk of just waffling on about what IoT is, let's talk about some applications of, of IoT. And I'm going to go back to the, the little poster I had at the start of the talk because this, I, I pinched this, um, I, I, I can't remember who I pinched it from, but it's it's a fantastic slide because it actually covers some of the most important uh, industry types and application types that we're going to see. So we can see, I, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Yeah, so we've everything from security, transport, um, we could say security on our, on our, the likes of our personal belongings. Over here, agriculture. Um, industry manufacturing, uh, we have consumer products and, and convenience. Again, consumer convenience, transport and logistics is a huge application for this. Um, in fact, I'm going to show you this little sensor here. So that's a proprietary off-the-shelf sensor, sensor. It's 30 centimeters, 30 millimeters by 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. That's a, a disposable, you buy it once, you nail it onto the side of a pallet. And it's got all your accelerometers and environmental uh, sensors, you know, for checking pressure, temperature, humidity. So you could be protecting a, a, a 10 million pound piece of art coming from an auction, or it could be electronics, or it could be food, or it could be the new Pfizer vaccine in transport. But you could be uh, harvesting very important data the whole way through the transport and logistics chain with that. Moving around on the diagram, we can see we've other stuff like uh, convenience, home entertainment. Again, we've we've uh, sanitation bins, we've power management, more convenience stuff here. And right up here, I kept this for last because this is the areas, area where I've seen the biggest growth recently is health, uh, connected health. And we're starting to see more and more um, connected health applications being developed where people have continuous glucose monitors attached to the back of their upper arm uh, and they're they're detecting pre-diabetes 10 years before it could ordinarily be detected be, uh, you know in the past just by monitoring trends and stuff that you can't see little spikes and little things little nuances that you, you can't see otherwise so applications are vast um, and and I, I think that the, the number of applications is just going to grow as people become more familiar with the technology and the type of, of solution that, that we can build using the technology. So I'll move on and have a look at this next slide is just two simple applications. And these, these are what I like to consider the kind of the verticals. So the reasons that we, we go down the route of IoT can be very different. So if we have a look, those bins could be in, you know, they could be in the middle of Belfast, Dublin, Greystones, where I live, they could be anywhere. Um, they do a couple of things that's very clever. So they have a solar panel on the top of the battery. Uh, the first thing they do is they, they lower a concrete block onto the waste intermittently. So they compact the waste and that reduces the amount of collection cycles, the amount of maintenance has to be done. But they're also connected. Uh, originally, these were connected by a mobile phone network. Um, a lot of them still are. They will summon a collection when they are full. So unless the bill, uh, sorry, unless the bin has been used and it's full and needs service, it just sits there, minding its own business. And the, your 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 workforce and your pollution and everything that's associated with going out and collecting the bin or going out and and, and taking you know, 80% empty bags out of 80% of your bins. That's all the thing of the past. So you can streamline your process, reduce your costs, and, and in theory, you can have a better product at the end of the day. Where you look at the other photograph, and it's it's supposedly a, a, a guy cruising down the road in self-driving mode in his car. So there's another vertical where when you think of the self-driving car, one assumes that the car is littered with sensors and cameras and it can detect people at all sorts of distance and whatnot. Unfortunately, there was the first ever self-driving car fatality a couple of years ago in the United States and all the sensors on the car just didn't actually see a pedestrian pushing a bike across the road and there was a fatality. But for self-driving cars to work, the cars need to be omni-aware of each other 
So you're going to have at a server level, uh, I jump into my car and I say, I'd like to go to the centre of Dublin city. And somebody else coming from Belfast says they want to go to the centre of Dublin city. Those two cars, those two journeys will be planned uh, on a centralised system, which will be aware of the two cars arriving into the same destination at the same point. So the traffic management system will be aware of the journeys. The cars will be aware of the journeys. They'll be aware of the roads that they share on those journeys. But where, where, where I believe we'll see a lot of IoT improving self-driving cars is where the environment becomes smart. So the road becomes smart. It's able to see and know and be aware of people or animals or other you know, potential hazards on the road all the time. So, so I, I honestly believe we're going to see quite a lot of um, technology rolled out in the environment as, as a support or as, a, as an integral part of uh, self-driving cars before we have fully integrated self-driving cars. So uh, this has been a, a very high value uh, consumer application for IoT. I can see this uh, just like health uh, being one of the, the big driving uh, forces in seeing more and more deployment and rollout of, of IoT as time moves on. And as I said a, a moment ago, health is just something I've seen a, a huge amount of growth in over the last couple of years. Um, uh, people are, are, there are now businesses, uh, big businesses uh, receiving huge capital funding, uh, particularly in the United States, which um, are, the whole business model is based around um, digital online medical care delivery. Uh, and a lot of that requires feedback from, from the patient or from, from the end user. So using sensors attached to the person, whether it's monitoring heart or liver or, or uh, blood sugar level, anything like that. So this is all coming down the road and we're going to see it as, as time goes on. So they would be what I would consider being kind of verticals in this matrix. The reasons why we will consider looking for an IoT solution. Moving on, um, just a, a, a little graphic uh, about Moore's Law. So a lot of you guys will be familiar with Moore's Law, and he was one of the guys who was one of the founders of Intel. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other semiconductor company he was a founder of. Uh, anyway, it's it's not really important, but he kind of suggested the number of transistors on microchips would double every two years. Um, and I think about two years after that, he suggested that the price of silicon would half every two years or something along those lines. And what's, what's outstanding about that graph is not the particular information that's on it, but the fact that it has been a reasonably linear relationship since typically the late 1960s, right the way up to the present. So we have seen an increase in computing power as, as time moved on. And that hasn't just allowed us to have more powerful servers or allowed us to have more powerful desktop computers. It's allowed us to have more powerful mi uh, mobile phones and microcontrollers in, in everything. So there's microcontrollers in the remote control for your TV, then there's microcontrollers in your TV. And this all spawns the, uh, the, the technology which then filters down and gives us the wherewithal to deliver some of the solutions to the, some of the problems we were discussing a couple of minutes ago. So these are, I would consider the, the horizontals in the matrix. So some of the stuff that, that we see uh, changing really, really rapidly now is, is software. So I'm not a natural software guy, but I, I write reasonably powerful pieces of code now. And quite often I don't actually write any code. I'm, I'm kind of using um, almost pre-built software, lots of libraries and stuff like that. Um, and we, we, I'm, I'm using radios, software defined radio, so I don't really need to know a huge amount about the radio. It, it becomes pre-configured, pre-tuned, and, and uh, silicon, that which, which includes the entire LoRa radio protocol actually on the chip. I don't have to learn a single thing about that. I don't have to be a radio expert. So these are the, these are the technology changes which which I would consider to be the the, the horizontals. And when when you look at the any engineering solution, it's always going to be a compromise, whether it's power, price, cost, flexibility. You know, this this it, it any solution is just the best compromise of of what you have available to to solve the problem. And 
as time moves on and we see uh, one or two of the guys talking about some some microcontrollers and and stuff earlier on, um, more and more powerful microcontrollers becoming more and more available. Um, so these are the things that I have found uh, I've been able to to, to deploy um, and use to my advantage in in building solutions. So we just move on, have a look, and and see. Uh, how um, sorry, have, have a look at so, some of the some of the buzzwords or some names and things like that you might might be familiar with. So these are just bands. Um, a lot of them are protected uh, by patents and stuff like that. So and, and I put these up here just because some of these will be familiar to you guys and some of them won't. So uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Uh, we are used to these are all radio protocols and they're all in the unlicensed part of the spectrum but there's a couple of different pieces of spectrum at play here so I, i'm going to introduce the different technologies here just only just to, to mention them uh, so that i can differentiate between what we're used to seeing already and what i'm hoping to talk about this evening which is it which is all what you guys will understand is what sub one gigahertz ism band software defined radio uh, so there's a couple of different types of that so just looking at the at the screen some of the, the network protocols we're used to seeing already uh, would be bluetooth wife wi-fi your nfc uh, some of the stuff that i'm having fun with at the moment zigbee uh, in the states they have another protocol called they call it z-wave in the states again Pretty much all of these are on the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. So that's your instrumentation, scientific and medical unlicensed spectrum. So all licensed, but there are regulations about uh, how you use that bandwidth in terms of power and, and your, your, your signal and not, not actually hogging all the free space on, on that spectrum. So you'd be familiar with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and these would be... Uh, what we would call personal area networks and wide area networks. And I'm going to move on to another slide in a second, which will kind of differentiate between these and some of the IoT networks. Uh, and we'll have a look at actually the next two slides. It kind of will hopefully paint a picture in your head about, or in your mind, how, how these different protocols uh, are optimized or where this compromise uh, sits uh, to suit the different applications. So. Once we've seen all the brands there, I'm going to have a look at this slide here. So there's a little bit of data here. There's one mistake I realized. I, I actually copied and pasted uh, to the top two rows. All the data in the top two rows should be swapped over with the exception of the logos on the left. So NFC actually is up to about four centimeters range, whereas Bluetooth is actually up to about 10 meters. So you can see the top two rows should be flipped with the exception of the logo. But this is again a matrix, which I'm hoping will allow you to, to understand where the, the different compromises are with different protocols. So if we have a look at NFC, this is this is your near field communications. It's really, you have to have your, almost your antennas touching. And you're used to using NFC to tap with your phone, for example. Um, but we can see that the, the, the amount of data we're going to transfer is very small, 100 k bits per second. Um, it's on a, a, an ISM band, again, unlicensed spectrum. Um, and it is optimized for low power. So there's, there's a couple of things that are important to notice. The range, the data transfer rate, um, the part of the spectrum that it's, it's using, and then... Um, the power optimization. So these these are all the kind of the, the cornerstones of, of how we build a, an IoT solution. Or, or typically, we're going to be we're going to be looking for something which optimizes these to, to guide us in our selection of hardware and software. As we move down, we can see that uh, Bluetooth, which should actually be the second row down, uh, we have a, a reasonably good range and and data transfer rate up to about ten meters. So this would be. What we call a personal area network (PAN), um, not a huge amount of data, two megabits per second. This is now on, on unlicensed spectrum, so it's on the 2.4 gigahertz that we we see all our um, Wi-Fi using in our home networks, for example. And it is 
as we can see, it's optimized for, for extended battery life. So it's a very low power protocol in terms of its, its battery power consumption or overall power consumption. As we move down to Wi-Fi, we see the Wi-Fi we get kind of 100 meters. Now you do see pe people using uh, focused antennas uh, and dishes uh, getting five and 10 kilometers with Wi-Fi and it is possible, but we can see that um, and where we're used to it with our, our 2.4 gigahertz, we can see 100 megabits per second. Uh, and it's again on unlicensed spectrum in our homes. Anyone who's tried to, to automate anything and use Wi Fi as the radio backhaul uh, on a battery powered device will know that it is not optimized for power consumption. So uh, there is a, quite a lot of, of what they call overhead in. Uh, Wi-Fi protocols. So you have your devices are the whole time exchanging uh, messages over and back, which are not, not the data you're transferring. They're, they're just management. There's quite a lot of management in Wi-Fi. So there's quite a lot of power wasted. So it, I would say it's not a good protocol for, for IoT. We have a look at stuff like LoRaWAN and NB-IoT. So these, you can see on LoRaWAN, we have 50 K bits per second. So we're, we're talking about very small amounts of data transfer. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about uh, the what you see, ISM 900, and I think it's it may even say 433 behind there as well. Uh, 433 would be used in the United States of America, but and, and in Europe it's 868. But this is ISM band unlicensed radio spectrum, which we can use with certain constraints. 50 kilobytes per second. So when you consider, typically we're, we're shifting very, very small messages like a, 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 the humidity from a sensor, or the, a light is on, a switch is open, you know, something like that. It's going to be very small um, message packets. Typically 10, uh, 10 kilometers range, which is fairly superb. Um, and it is optimized for, for power. And we'll have a look at an, an actual example of, of how optimized it is for power before the talk is over. Uh, NB-IoT uh, would be fairly similar. It's, it's, on the, uh, it's, it's on the mobile phone licensed uh, parts of the spectrum, as, as is pretty much everything else you see here. So, so everything else you can see is on licensed uh, cellular spectrum. Now, for somebody developing a solution, you are backed into a corner there. So there can be applications where you have very good coverage. For, for example, in a lot of our, our urban situations, we, we have fantastic mobile phone coverage. So it can be a no brainer. You're always gonna go with um, for something like NB-IoT because it's optimized for power and your coverage is so good. But the other protocols, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, you can see here, they're neither optimized for long range, they, they, they can carry huge amounts of data, which we don't need. And they're using licensed parts of the spectrum, which means we're always going to be paying uh, quite a premium for that connection. So I'm hoping what you're seeing is, is some of the reasons I've been focused towards uh, Sigfox, LoRaWAN, NBIOT, uh, I started off with some of these uh, protocols and then realized that they, they fell short of the mark in terms of what I needed in developing solutions. Um, and uh, over, a process, over a period of time, even though I would describe myself as agnostic with regard to protocol, I've just found LoRaWAN, it ticks all the boxes. It's unlicensed spectrum, carries plenty of data, um, there's very good infrastructure. Actually, you guys in the north have, have amazing infrastructure. I'll talk about it a little bit later on uh, for Laura One. Um, but just moving on to the next slide, this is a, a graphic which will hopefully give you an idea. You know, in, in a nice, simple uh, illustration where everything sits. So I was talking about our. our personal area networks, and we have these, the likes of our Bluetooth and our Zigbee uh, and NFC or FID down here. These are all fantastic where you're right up close with your devices and you want to use uh, wireless. But you can see that there's a compromise here where the amount of data that we can transfer is, is limited and the distance we can transfer that is limited. So even though we may be optimized for power down here, we have a compromise 
uh, in the the amount of power we have, the amount I sorry the amount of, the amount of data we can transfer and the distance we can move it. As you look at your local area networking, you'd be familiar with at home. This is your Wi-Fi. You can see that you can stream, you know, rich video. There's no problem with power, but in terms of range, we kind of run out of puff at about 100 meters. Um, so there, therein it lies the compromise with your with your Wi-Fi. As as we move across to the top right corner, we can see where we have wide area networks. Uh, these would be our. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to move on to that slide. Uh, these are wide area networks, such as our, our mobile phone cellular uh, protocols we can use and uh, satellite as well. So again, these have uh, fantastic data transfer rates but uh, and, and our range is improving, but they're not optimized for power. And then we have down in this bottom right corner, we can see all the protocols uh, which would be used typically in our, our IoT applications, that would be our LoRaWAN, Sigfox, LTE, 3G, PP, and NB IoT. So these, these in the in the right hand side here, the 3G, PP, the LTE, M, and NB IoT, these would be uh, cellular protocols. Uh, Sigfox is a proprietary uh, protocol. Again, it's on the sub gigahertz, sub one gigahertz spectrum, ISM spectrum. Uh, and if anyone has questions about Sigfox, I, I'll, I'll talk about it at the end. Um, I've tried to use it in the past, and I've, I've found that it, it is quite limited. And then LoRaWAN, which would be really the kind of the area, of the, the, the radio protocol, which I'd be most familiar with. So this hopefully just gives you an idea of, of the kind of the buzzwords, the names, the the radios, the spectrums they use, and and kind of how we how I would arrive in developing an engineering solution uh, to one of the verticals which we were discussing earlier on at something like LoRaWAN, uh, which would be my my favourite at the moment. And then just one or two other things you can see on on this. Um, we have huge growth in LoRaWAN, uh, and we have open networks. And both of those, you guys in the north of Ireland are are absolutely blessed. Um, digital catapult in which is I think pan UK uh, kind of investment fund uh, or investment um, incentive has actually rolled out a stack of, of gateways uh, all over the, the province of, of um, so it, it allows you guys to connect very easily into the network and do your development and testing but I'll have a little chat about that later on because um, it will be a little bit more specific when we see uh, the things network later so just, uh, you guys are, are so I, I, I'm not an amateur licensed radio operator. So I, I know when I say practically nothing, I mean absolutely nothing about amateur licensed radio, what you guys do or, or, or uh, the technology that you use. But essentially with, with uh, digital backhaul of digital data, everything in a computer is going to be a one or a zero or a series of ones and zeros. And we, we want to put that message onto uh, a radio, uh, just a wave like this. So, so we have a typical waveform like that. There are kind of three basic, simple ways that we, we can modulate data onto that radio wave. So they would be amplitude shift keying. So we, we can consider in the, in the, when you look at the, the, the waveform there, we, we can half the amplitude for a zero and, and have double the amplitude for a one. And we can easily then encode ones and zeros onto that by shifting the amplitude um, up and down. And that's very simple, but it does have compromise because uh, where, where you attenuate your radio signal, your amplitude may appear to have fallen. So it, it, it becomes less robust and less uh, reliable as, as a means of, of transferring your ones and zeros because lots of other things can affect the radio waveform and make it look like a, a one is a zero or vice versa. We can look at frequency shift keying. So you can see the frequency of the radio wave here. So we, we, we can literally compress the radio waves for ones and zeros uh, and, and we can differentiate between ones and zeros. So we can shift the frequency uh, up and down uh, to, in, to, to, to carry our, our modulate our ones and zeros uh, on, on the radio waveform. 
or we can phase shift keying. So in, in this diagram here, we can see that the zero crossing point is, is at zero degrees in the waveform. And we see half a wave later at the, the zero, wave, or zero crossing point again, and a full wave later, we're back at the zero crossing point. So we, we can shift uh, the phase a one quarter of a wavelength left and right, if that makes sense in that diagram. And, and we can use this to modulate our ones and zeros. But again, there's lots of, lots of timing and lots of other things that go wrong and, and make life difficult in doing that. So what makes some of these protocols really cool, and we see it in LoRa, is um, use a different protocol, which is known as chirped spread spectrum. So using a piece of the spectrum at sub one gigahertz, 868 megahertz, uh, what we're actually doing, you can see in the, the waveform there is we're changing, we're keeping the amplitude the same, but we're changing the frequency. But we're not just changing from one frequency to another, we're, we're changing over a very specific time period. We're going from a very specific frequency to another very specific frequency at a very specific rate of change. Now, I'm not very musical, but you can imagine in one instance, you're going to have an upwards chirp and other instance, you're going to have a downwards chirp. And one is going to rise in tone and the other is going to fall in tone if it was an audible tone. And this is so predictable and it's so precise that large chunks of this can be missing. And the end result is the same. I would like to... The, the easiest way I can liken it to is well, part of my background in industrial automation was in package marking, barcoding and data matrix or a 2D matrix. You can have a vast amount of a, a two-dimensional barcode missing. The, 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 the existence of every single black dot in a two-dimensional code is dependent on every other dot. So you can have typically up to 25 or 30 percent of the code obscured or missing and you can still completely decode it. It's because of that unique relationship between all the different dots in the code. And it's very much the same when you have a chirped spread spectrum. So the next diagram I'm going to show you will hopefully give you a, a, an idea of what it would look like on a waterfall diagram. Now, normally a waterfall diagram would be turned at 90 degrees. Um, but because of the way I... I illustrated it on this slide uh, with the rising and falling chirps I've, I've replicated here. So in fact, what you're looking at here is on waterfall diagram, uh, you're looking at the start of a transmission packet on the LoRa protocol. And you can see there's, in fact, there's a little bit of interference here just in the graphic in the waterfall diagram, but there are, I think, eight up chirps followed by two down chirps and that would be the preamble and the start uh, key for a data packet. And we can see in this part of the, the waterfall diagram, we see that the chirps are interrupted parts of the way through each chirp. So we have a full chirp from bottom to top here. Then we have a truncated chirp here, but precisely the point where it's truncated is important. We have another full chirp. We have another one that starts here. So. It's a very robust protocol, far more robust than trying to modulate the frequency or the amplitude or the phase of radio. We expect to hear a chirp start at a very precise point and end at a very precise point. And anything that's deviant from that precise path, we can decode using software, which is baked onto our LoRa radio chip so we can decode that, uh, that, that kind of break in the, in, in the predictable sequence of the chirp. Uh, that, that is what we, it defines the data that's modulated on the radio. So I'm not sure am I explaining it very well, but essentially the chirp is so robust in an up chirp or a down chirp that any deviation is very easily recognized. So the result of that in a, a protocol such as LoRa is that we can, we can hear radio below the noise floor. And in layman's terms, that's like having a whispered conversation in a busy pub or a nightclub with somebody on the other side of the room. So even though the, the noise 
surrounding us is way above the noise that we're hearing. We're completely tone deaf to anything except what we're listening for, which is the the, the lower up radio. And it's because we're we're listening for that precise up chirp or down chirp. We just don't hear anything else. All we hear is that up chirp and down chirp. So the advantages of this is that it allows a radio with 25 milliwatts radiated power. So you're talking about your typical isotropic kind of donut shaped radiated pattern from a, something like a just a, a vertical, vertically polarized antenna, omnidirectional antenna reaching 200 plus kilometers in perfect conditions from a little small device. And when I say 200 kilometers, I've done it um, and it does work. So I don't know if any of you guys know the geography of the South very well, but uh, I live about four kilometers from the coast uh, between Wicklow and Bray uh, near a town called Greystones. And I get a lot of traffic from the UK coming across from Wales uh, on my antenna. So, and I'm not even on high ground. I'm, I think 45 meters, 48 meters or something above sea level. So um, it is a very, very robust protocol and it carries the data very securely from one end to the other. One or two of the tweaks that we can make on this. So if you imagine uh, the, the diagram I showed you two slides back showing the uh, up chirps and down chirps, the angle of the chirp here is fairly important. So we have some tuning in the video. So within any of our LoRa transmissions, we can we can set the the rate at which we get from one end of the chirp to the other, if that makes sense. And it's it's known as the spreading factor in the, in the radio setup. And by extending the radio or the spreading factor, we actually make the chirp longer and slower. So you can see we have a few spreading factors which are standardised in the protocol. We it's spreading factor seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. And each of these becomes progressively more robust at transferring data because we, we know the precise shape of the up chirp or the down chirp. But if, if we're not sure if we're getting the start and finish of it uh, or, or getting the whole chirp, it, we start to lose uh, precision. So we can slow down the whole chirp on the radio. And this is, this is exactly what's happening here. We just, we just spread out the transmission over a slightly longer period. Now we're getting back to where we lose power efficiency. So we can see in developing a solution, the ideal setup is we're going to, with good radio range, we're going to have a, a low spreading factor. So our radio is going to be on the air for the minimum amount of time possible. So now we're getting to understand the whole low power wide area networking. So we, we now have a protocol which is capable of transmitting small amounts of data over huge distances, like tens to hundreds of kilometers in an ideal situation, but with some tuning to allow us to, to idealize the, uh, the, the actual radio transmission with that compromise that we're going to consume more power uh, in doing so. And that's a kind of an important part, uh, important thing to, to just be aware of. Um, so these are super low power applications, and I'm going to show you just how low power in, in a few minutes. On the subject of, of power, this is just uh, there's a couple of numbers thrown onto this. This this is a very standard kind of a setup. Anyone who's building a, a, a any kind of radio is going to understand that you have your your maximum transmitter power. And I, some of the numbers I was talking about earlier on, 20 milliwatts um, or 20 25 milliwatts. You can see that we have uh, 20 dBm is is our maximum power. Uh, coming out of our radio, we're going to have our cable losses, uh, any kind of gain in the antenna. We'll have our uh, loss across whatever the path is. It could be anything up to 10 or 20 or in an urban situation might only be a few hundred meters. Um, but we're going to have a signal path loss. Again, we might have some gain on our receiving antenna and we'll have injection and cable losses uh, on the way to our, our receiving radio. One of the things to notice here is these radios, even though they're marked TX and RX, the radios we use in most applications and most protocols are actually transceivers. So we have uh, we have the both the ability to send messages 
from our end device back to our network. We also have the ability to send uh, messages back to our devices, including uh, potentially patches, updates, software upgrades, and, and so on and so forth. So we have bi-directional um, uh, data transfer there. But you can see in, in the case of LoRaWAN, um, we're kind of well catered for in terms of the uh, the the total link budget and having a look there yesterday I'm not sure it's even on the on the screen but our our uh, our total link budget um is quite high uh, which allows us quite a lot of scope for this part in the middle which is which is our our uh, signal loss over our path so if we optimize um our our transmitter and receiver design reasonably good antennas reasonably good gain all we have to worry about really is is this part in the middle. Uh, we have quite a quite a big link budget um, uh, to allow us to, to transfer the, the messages from one end to the other. So one of the things that I had mentioned that you might have found a little bit confusing uh, when I was talking to you there is the difference between LoRa and LoRa One. So. What I've described up to now has been LoRa, and that is exclusively what we see in this part of the slide on the left-hand side here. So that is the communication, the radio communication between our end device and what we call a gateway. So I have a gateway on, on the roof of my house. It's a home-built gateway. They, they've gone from typically about a thousand euros proprietary or a thousand pounds, even proprietary price for a, a gateway six or seven years ago, uh, down to a couple of hundred. Uh, pounds now for, for a reasonably good quality industrial type gateway. So this is the radio link we're talking about and that uses the LoRa protocol. So LoRa is what we were talking about the last few minutes. It's this very robust, low power, uh, long range radio communication. What LoRa One is, it would include our end to end device stack. So we're talking about we have application servers, join servers, and um, we have the regular internet stuck in the middle here, transferring our data, and then we have gateways. So possibly the easiest way for me to explain this is uh, I have a gateway on the roof of my house. It's registered to the Things Network, which is a Dutch initiative. Um, it's a free and open to use uh, IoT network. So everything you see in pale blue here is provided for me free of charge. They operate a commercial uh, uh, business as well, which is called the, the Things Industries. And in fact, the Things Industries are, are the people who are contracted to provide the, the Things network that you guys have from Digital Catapult in the north of Ireland. Um, so my gateway is registered to the Things network. So when I have a device, um, anything like this, and we'll have a look at this this uh, humane trap in a few minutes. When I have a device that, that um, sends out a message, in the case of this device, this is gonna be a deployed or not deployed, so it's a one or a zero. That is transmitted by radio and in, in this application only at 15 meters to the antenna in my house. But it then heads through the regular internet uh, back to all the servers in the Things Network. And what the WAN, the wide area network, Part is all the security that allows the end device to be connected to my application. And that application can be anything from a database to a visualization to, it could be, uh, for example, the lock on the gate I was talking about earlier on. So uh, the applications are as, as, as far-fetched as, you, as you're imaginative. But one of the things that we have with, with, within LoRaWAN is we have end-to-end -end encryption of our data. So there's, there's some fairly robust keys used uh, to generate the sessions between the device from one end to the other. We have our low power radio link to the gateway, the gateway then using the regular internet and back to uh, the servers, which then deliver that information to me to use, whether it's whether it's uh, knowing whether a, a trap is deployed, a bin needs to be emptied, uh, or somebody has a, has a blood marker which is wrong uh, or not right in, in health application. So you can see that's the difference between LoRa and LoRa WAN. So this is the Things Network that I was uh, discussing there a second ago. I'd, I'd encourage anyone who wants to have a go to, to, to just set up an account on the Things Network. Um, it's free. 
uh, you just register, register a profile. I know I sound like a bit of an evangelist for them, but uh, it is free and it works. It, and you guys are well catered for in the north. There are antennas pretty much covering all the open ground uh, across the whole province. Um, so as far as I'm aware, you guys can just register an account and, and back all your uh, gateways which are available. So I'm going to show you, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to try and uh, swap share to a different screen. I'm going to show you just a visualization I have here in Chrome. Uh, we were talking about, uh, this is just a little, I don't know if anyone is familiar with, with Node-RED. I just use Node-RED uh, as a way of visualizing some of the stuff. So there's two, two applications I'm going to show you on this screen here. Both of these are devices registered on the Things Network. Um, I've taken the sensor out of my aloe vera plant there, so that's not looking too healthy. This on the left, I'm keen to show you. So sure. that is... Gary, we're still on the uh, Things Network uh, oh. profile there. So... Oh, I, sorry, I think you, exit, yeah. is that working? I hope, I think uh, I've, I've exited that presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you seeing Chrome there, are you? Yeah, we're back on Chrome there, yeah. Okay, so this, this is just a visualization I have on uh, Node-RED. Uh, so you missed the top of the screen there. So it's, it's, it's only just to allow me to visualize one or two sensors, which, are, which I have here on the, on the table beside me. This one here is of interest because um, that there is a device with a single lithium cell. It's a 3.3 volt cell. Um, and I installed that cell in April, three years ago at a voltage of 3.3 volts, and it has transmitted the temperature and humidity and barometric pressure in my kitchen every 15 minutes for two years. I think it's eight months and two weeks at this stage. <laughs> and the, the cell has dropped 0 0.1 of a volt. Now, this device doesn't know how close or how far it is from a gateway. So it transmits, it's obviously, it, this is set up on the, the shortest spreading factor. So it's optimized for low power. It's based on an Arduino microcontroller, but everything on that microcontroller has been tweaked for low power. So for example, the it has no voltage regulator. It's connected directly onto the battery. Um, when it, it and, and I'll talk about deep sleep because that's the only the, the other part I was going to say about these devices. So it uses deep sleep uh, in between reading the sensor and transmitting the message. This device goes into deep sleep. So it shuts down everything bar its very most basic heartbeat within the microcontroller when it's not doing anything. So for those 15 minutes in between transmissions, Including in the case of this, it slows down its heartbeat. It, it actually it ramps everything down to the point where it is almost completely off. It's barely, barely alive. And it then wakes up every 15 minutes, reads this sensor, which is just on a little chip there, and translates that to, uh, or transmits that using the LoRaWAN. So lo looking at this um, on Chrome here, you can see every 15 minutes, it just sends out the barometric pressure, the temperature, uh, and the humidity uh, in my kitchen. And it has done that. Oh, I, I could go into the Things Network. It might take me a moment to look at it. I won't look at it now. But every 15 minutes for, for almost uh, three years now, and as you can see, the battery is, is almost completely full. Another application I was talking to you about is this live trap. So this live trap is, is a very humane trap, obviously if we're gonna take the poor creature out of it uh, before the creature suffocates or, or uh, just dies of exhaustion. Well, you can see very, it, it, this, this could be 10 kilometers away from, um, this could be two kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers away from an antenna. And you can see as soon as I trigger that trap, uh, we're, we're getting a, a visualization. So this could be in a control center with 
uh, 10,000 traps deployed all around the place. So right beside where I live is Druid's Glen Golf Club. And uh, Druid's Glen pride themselves on, on having some one of the most ex- exclusive hotel golf clubs in, in the whole of Ireland. The last thing they want is somebody pulling up outside the front door with rats are us. Uh, sign written all over the side of their van with people uh, dropping five and ten thousand uh, dollars a day to play golf. <laughs> so what what they really want is is like that guy in Pulp Fiction. I can't remember his name. <laughs> the guy who fixes stuff. <laughs> they want somebody to arrive in a, in a with a silver briefcase and disappear into the kitchen and come out with a briefcase. And um, and that's that's where we get applications like this for the the people interested in radio. That's a printed antenna. As you can see, this is this is built with capped on tape. It was built during another presentation I did um, to to a, a group of people in a room. We actually assembled this on the day and built it with a bit of hot glue, uh, a microcontroller, and a printed antenna. But there's an application of of something which could be commercialized tomorrow. In fact, I think one or two people have commercialized those already. And the last example I brought to show you is this. Again, that's a proprietary. This is. A, something that's not homespun. This is a proprietary off-the-shelf solution and this is designed to be screwed into a hole in the side of the block that uh, spaces a pallet off the ground. So it's actually supposed to go in, in the, the leg of a pallet, uh, measures the temperature, humidity, air pressure and g-forces and orientation. So it, it, this is normally programmed with limits so if something is turned on its side or receives a shock load above a certain threshold, above a certain temperature, humidity, this thing will wake up and will start telling telling tales across the network. And these are already being deployed in logistics and shipping um, for, for as, as a solution. So that's just an idea of what you get for your money. That's about 50 or $60 as far as I know. Uh, you'd, you would use that on high value cargo, you'd use it once and you might never want to see it again. Um, it would have served its purpose. So, and that kind of brings me to the end of, of the talk. Now, I, I didn't really go into a huge amount on the physics of the radio because it's not my uh, so it, it's, not, it's not my area of expertise. But hopefully, I've given you an idea of of just how low power and long range we can go with these devices and some of the applications that we're going to see them deployed on. Um, I'd love to answer any questions if anyone is curious. And there was us thinking that uh, radio was just used for talking, Gary. Um, the, the question I sort of have is, is is literally the automation unlimited? You can put it to anything. Uh, you can obviously ask it to monitor anything you put a sensor to. But, um, you know, is, is, is there a, a thing of actually can you automate too much to the point where it restricts what you want to do because you're setting it a set parameters? Um, for example, you know, we like to take shortcuts on easiest way to do things, but would there be a case of automation where the computer says, actually, that's not the best way to do it, so it can be restrictive and maybe the opposite effect of what you're trying to do? I think I understand what you're asking. I, I think the answer to that is is absolutely. And, and that is where, it, to my mind, that's where something is not very well designed as a system. And I, I don't mean to sound disingenuous, but if you look at, at the, the, the various compromises, so the, the hardware, software, the radio, the range, the power management, um, the applications, if, you, if we... If we push a square peg into a round hole, it's never going to be a good fit. So a very well-designed system is going to leverage the best characteristics uh, possible in terms of, uh, this This is 90% battery, so it's a single circuit board inside there. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be smaller, it's going to be light, it's going to have long range. Compromise on this is the antenna, so the range isn't superb on this. Um, but again, it's not supposed to be... Uh, 10 kilometers away from, from a base station. This is supposed to be in a ship or a truck and talking to a gateway that's moving. So uh, to answer your question, I think the answer is it, w- when a system is designed well, it doesn't exceed, it, it doesn't exceed what it, it ought to exceed. It, does, it doesn't yeah. over, yeah. 
I, I'm probably not explaining very well, but I think a, a very well designed, a well engineered solution, that's not going to be an issue. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, get that. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, good evening. Thanks, uh, Gary, for that introduction. Uh, the um, church you talk about, <clears throat> what sort of spread, what are the stop and start frequencies? You're going from uh, one kilohertz to two kilohertz or more. So uh, it, it, now off the top of my head, I'm, I'm loath to quote numbers, but on the 868 uh, unlicensed spectrum, there are various channels available. So uh, there, there, there are several channels across the available spectrum which are used, and uh, the LoRa spread spectrum uses certain bandwidth for each channel. Um, so to, to answer your question, it's it's always the same frequency. It's always 868. Yeah, yeah. I used to work with um, uh, telemetry stuff, um, but that was using FM or PM. Right. So, so yeah. essentially, what we what, what happens is we have. If you remember the 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 chirp spread spectra, the chirp that we saw, uh, where the waveform becomes more and more compressed. Mm. That's that's such a robust. That is such a robust. Uh, shape or such a robust piece of mathematical engineering from one end to the other, that when when we interrupt that and and superimpose our data, we use we use an algorithm to interrupt that in a predictable way at, mm. uh, when we transmit and when we receive at the other end the interrupted signal, we can then remove the data from that and do modulating and demodulating the signal onto onto that waveform. So I'm not 100% sure. Do, do I understand your question right? But it's there are channels. There are channels across the available parts of the spectrum, which is which is on the unlicensed 868 megahertz band. I don't know the exact numbers. Okay. Of hmm. So yeah, when I used it for certainly for FM, there were 25 kilohertz uh, channels available there, and uh, one used the allotted one. But. Um, so to give you so, to give you to give you an idea in, within the LoRaWAN um, protocol, every time my every time a device transmits, it it randomly selects one of the channels. Uh -huh. um, the, the reason it does this is because you may be compromised on a particular channel. So the the bandwidth is divided up into channels, and it randomly selects a new channel every time it transmits. There may be some there may be some other device that's completely swamping a. a Part of the spectrum, uh, you may you may be physically compromised by some environmental factor. Um, so every transmission typically happens on one of eight parallel channels. So there are eight channels. I'm not sure the exact spacing between them, but the oh, protocol okay. is the same on each channel. Um, and you will you will see. In fact, if I go in and have a look in the Things Network at at uh, we can see here. I, I can possibly give you a look. I don't know if you're still seeing my screen here, but I'm going to show you some of the the metadata that comes through. With you'll you'll need to hit the share screen button again there, Gary. Ah, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries. Just hit the share screen, and I try that one. Now, hopefully, you're you're seeing a little bit of this. This is the console on the on the things network. So when I see a, a radio coming in, um, so move on. You guys are. I can't see some of the sliders here. So you can see that the the radio comes in with a whole load of metadata, and we did see the channels changing. Uh, so here we have. Uh, frequency 867.9, and it is, it should tell me the channel, uh, channel zero. And if I go to the next transmission and have a look at the next transmission, uh, slide down, we will see that it is on ah, <laughs> channel zero. That shouldn't happen. <laughs> um, you go down to the next transmission. Yeah, so there's something going on wrong there. It may be just... Uh, 
it may be the same message is getting resent. But it should change the channel. Every every single transmission is randomly sent on a normal, normally on a different channel. I'd say that's something to do with the code I have in this device. In fact, if I trigger it now and get a couple of fresh transmits, um, I'd probably get. Uh, different channels, but they, hopefully that answers your question. You you can see some of the metadata that comes through just in terms of signal strength and, and signal to noise ratio. Um, that's all transmitted with the data. So we can we can do some monitoring at the server end, server side. We can see how how optimally located and how well placed and how correctly all our devices are operating just by looking at the metadata that travels with it. So. All this, all this is very small uh, in terms of the packet size. I didn't really get into the, 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 the size of the, the data that we're transmitting. I'm going to go back up to that last packet I sent to see if it's on a different channel now. And Oh, it's still on channel zero. I probably have, I probably have something in the code there uh, to keep it on channel zero. Uh, it's a while since I built that device, so uh, probably my bad. But in the real world, um, we, would, we would hop from channel to channel just in case there is... Uh, something that, that would compromise our, our signal. One of the other clever things um, that I didn't mention is when we, when we transmit information from a device such as this up to the network, there's, there's a window, a time window, where we can send data back down to the device. And there's a reason for this. Um, when we consider the, the deep sleeping application where, where we want this device to be 99.9% dead 99.99% of the time, we never know when we can send information to it. So there's two windows, two receive windows built into the protocol, which happen at a particular time frame immediately after the transmission. So I'm not going to deliberately not going to mention numbers because the protocol is changing later in this year. So it's going from one second and three seconds up to something like five seconds, a little bit longer. The idea being, um, and I've done this in the past, so I can, I can measure a sensor with my device, send that sensor information back to the server, which will then relay it to, for example, an application in my house, which will make a decision and then send an instruction back down to this device during the receive window. And then it goes back to sleep for however long. Could be a, a lot of the devices I've built, they would in fact go to sleep potentially forever, that they're only ever woken by an interrupt. So an external signal or sensor or movement or something will, will wake up the device. But it could be asleep almost entirely all the time, uh, unless there's some reason for it to be awake. Until the battery dies. Or the battery dies. Um, but when you consider a battery like this with with... Uh, 2,500 milliamp hours, and it's still, I would say, 80% full, uh, it's 80% charge uh, after nearly three years. Um, I think you put a bigger cell or a solar panel on and you have something which is deployed for life. Yeah, that sounds, sounds very interesting. The, um, the other point I'd like to take up with you is um, uh, maybe a little bit, um, uh, what should I say, challenging. It isn't meant as a challenge, but okay. uh, it's uh, this idea that signals are under the noise, um, something which I've, um, uh, a comment that I've met many times, but uh, when those signals are under the noise, they're then part of the noise, and so the noise floor rise, rises a little bit more, yeah. and <laughs> we get the nearly big old electronic smog smothering us. Well, I understand. I understand what you're saying. So it, I, I had a conversation with a guy in Amsterdam, actually just before the lockdown started last year at the Things Network conference, and he explained it to me very well. I'm not even going to try and <laughs> explain to you what he said to me, because it, it made sense to me when he explained it. So he was the way he put it to me is, a lot of the noise is just random noise. It's scattered. It's like snow on your TV screen. So even if 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 some of that randomized, uh, the way he explained it to me is, you imagine the snow on your TV screen. If some of that snow is in a non-random pattern, 
and it happens to be in the shape of a one or a zero, you can see the one or the zero, even if the screen is covered in snow. I don't know if that makes sense. You, you don't need to see a precise zero or precise one, but you can discern that it is a zero or a one through the, all the noise. Or you now, can see I'm, the whole of the Exorcist film there. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so... Uh, it, it, that that was one of the one of uh, part of how he tried to explain to me. He said that the signal, the the LoRa, the actual uh, protocol, uh, and the the uh, encoding of data onto the chirps is so robust compared to other competing protocols that you can see, you can discern your ones and zeros through all that uh, no, electro electronic fog, as you describe it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Does anyone else like. have, have any other questions here? Yes, it's Jeff, uh, GI0LM. Uh, thank you very much for a nice lecture. Um, just how long does a burst of this data, the transmission of this data take? Is it milliseconds, seconds, or, or what? It, it ranges from milliseconds up to about 1 or 1 1.5 seconds. So it depends on the length of the data that you're sending. So if you're sending quite a, a large packet at, at, a, at a big spreading factor, like spreading factor 11, it could take a second. But generally, it's milliseconds, like 20, 30, 40 milliseconds. And some of, some of the applications that I've built I've actually transmitted the amount of every every packet I transmitted was the amount of milliseconds I was awake for in the previous transmission. So what I did was I just stored the total milliseconds I was awake with the microcontroller into into a into a, a constant or into a uh, yes. Yeah, anyway, I, I just transmitted the amount of time that the device was awake for, and it's. It's 100 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, something like that. Very short. And that's just sending sending like two or three characters. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. There we so go. Just on, on, on Jeff's point, that pardon me, couldn't I talking across you, Dave, there, but in terms of in terms of optimizing power, it, it sounds it sounds a little bit uh uh, excessive to try and shorten the, the transmission times down to, you know, kind of fractions of milliseconds. But quite literally, wh when you're building the packets of data to transmit, you physically make them as small as possible. So you you, you convert them to binary and you, you bit shift into, you know, into, into the least number of bytes you can, you can upload at a time. Over like two, five, ten years, it can be the difference between having the device that is deployed without maintenance or a device which requires maintenance now if it's at the top of a mast you know or or you know going the, claiming well you just uh, quite often you just don't even want to go there simple as yeah yeah in there done that okay <laughs> okay well if, if there's no other questions gary thank you very much um for uh, another great um lecture and uh, really thought-provoking stuff around automation and everything else and the the internet of things and how even the radios um you know radio signals take uh take their part in that and everything it's definitely something uh that is thought-provoking and especially for those of us involved in radio and how we can automate things and, and everything else and nowadays when you come, as you said, about self-driving cars and, and smart homes and everything else, it's getting that direction, isn't it? So, uh, Gary, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd be uh, delighted to come along. If I could just add a parting note, I suggest you have a look at LP1NI. Uh, say and say that again? Catapult. LP1, LPWANNI. And uh, that's an initi initiative that, that pretty much anyone can engage with, um, as far as I'm aware, to, to connect up IoT devices. So, Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, again, 
The next uh, lecture uh, is uh, on the 9th of March, and uh, we're going to have um, the, the talk is going to be Radio with Bike, Boat, and Boots. And uh, it's going to be by Kev uh, Richardson. And uh, for those in the amateur radio community there, um, Kevin and uh, his daughter take part in Radio Adventures. So that is the title of our next lecture. Uh, do join us again next time. And if not, catch us up on YouTube. And don't forget to give us a like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Uh, from all us at the Mid-Ulster, 7-3. Catch you later. Thank you.